already moved my left right, right side of me, so I hate to throw that in. Saved more seats. I didn't know Harry was coming. So this event is sponsored by the UVM Student Government Association. The use of the University of Vermont's facilities for this event does not constitute an endorsement by the university. The University of Vermont does not endorse any candidates, organizations, or affiliates in connection with this or any other political campaign or election. So we're going to have about an hour of set questions that we have written up. Um, and then starting at 8 and going on to 8.30, we're going to have um, space for audience questions. Um, so thank you. All right, thanks for coming, folks. My name is Justin Morgan Parmet, and I will be moderating tonight's event. I, amongst many things, am also the co-director of the Lawrence Debate Union. As students, if you haven't heard of us, you should check us out. Uh, and if you have heard of us and haven't checked us out, you should check us out, too. All right, enough about that. I'm here to moderate a debate between four folks running for mayor of your city. So this is really important. I'm so glad to have you all here. I'm going to talk about a few rules and then I will introduce the candidates and we'll get started. So first rule was the candidates have agreed to keep their phones away for the entirety of the debate. Uh, and then the second rule is they agree to allow me as moderator a little bit of power to intervene if needed and just to be clear that is uh, including to stop a candidate when they run out of time or if they're talking over another candidate or if they are trying to avoid answering the question I can intervene to try and bring them back to the question. Uh, I'm sure I won't have to do that. And uh, other than that, we'll start with opening statements. For each candidate, they'll have three minutes. 
And then after that, we'll have a series of questions that are pre-prepared by uh, the Student Government Association. And each candidate will get two minutes to answer that question. We will start with one candidate and move forward. And then the next question, start with a different candidate and move forward. Uh, we will do it in order of seat one, two, three, and four. Seat one being the furthest from me and seat four being the closest. <laughs> we'll rotate through. Uh, after everyone speaks for two minutes, we'll give everybody a one minute follow up opportunity to uh, give a little bit of rebuttal to what was said uh, in regards to their statements. And uh, after we're done with our nine questions, we'll move into a half hour of, or after we're done with a certain nine questions, we'll move into questions for you all. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right, uh, I'm going to start by just introducing the four candidates, and then they will introduce themselves in their opening statement. So in seat one, we have Emma Mulvaney Stanek. In seat two, we have Chris Hasley. Aisley? Aisley, sorry. In C3, we have Joan Shannon, and in C4, we have Will Emmons. Uh, so let's start with candidate one and their three minute in opening statement. Thank you. Great, and I don't know where you are, so in terms of flagging us when we get close to time, so I'm going to try to keep an eye on you over there. Yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I'll kind of do this when you're close, and then I'll say time at three, and okay. that gives you like 10 seconds. It's a little hard to see you way down here, so I don't know if there's someone who can sit. You can? That'll be a little easier. Okay. okay. Thank you. Perfect. You ready? Yes. Okay, great. Go ahead. Hello everyone, and thank you to the SGA for organizing this debate tonight. I'm excited to be with all of you. My name is Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I'm a mom of two small kids. I lived in the Old North End for nearly 20 years. I run a small social change consulting company today, and I am a former city councilor here in Burlington who's represented both parts of the Old North End, and currently I'm a state legislator who represents half of the New North End and half of the Old North End. I'm proud to be sponsored, uh, sorry, sponsored, endorsed, in other words, by four unions representing many of Burlington's frontline workers, including social workers, health care providers, and folks working in the service industry downtown. This includes SEIU, CIR, which is the com Committee of Interns and Residents who work at UVM Medical Center. It includes ASME Local 1674, which represents the mental health professionals who work at Howard Center. It includes a UE Local 203 at City Market, and most recently, UFCW, which is the Scoopers United, the most recently organized union in Burlington, which represents the Ben and Jerry's workers. I'm proud to be back on campus. One of my first jobs out of college was directing the Vermont Livable Wage Campaign, and I spent many hours up here working with UVM students at the time, fighting for livable wages and dignity for the UVM staff, clerical staff, and professional staff. Uh, folks were organizing hunger strikes and taking over watermen, and there was great, I love the activism and vibrancy here on campus. I came back a little bit later when I was a union organizer and helped support one of the first organizing drives of the professional and clerical staff to organize a union finally here on campus. And I'm proud last week to have been here now um, and sponsored by a debate by, by that union that is now organized and representing those workers. And most recently, I've been back on campus to support the graduate students who are currently trying to organize a union to make sure they have a dignified workplace, respect here, uh, working conditions, and decent livable wages. I deeply love Burlington. This was the town when you're a kid who grows up in central Vermont or anywhere in rural Vermont. This is the big town that was vibrant and energized, a place you wanted to, to, uh, to live. And yet, I have a great deep concern for the health and well-being of our city. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety. As a mom of two small kids, I feel that as, I'm, as I bring my kids to the park or even walk them to school down North Street every morning. There's also a lot of divisiveness in City Hall, and that does not work for the city of Burlington, especially when we have so many complex challenges facing us and so many people suffering on the streets of Burlington. I know many of you in this room have struggled with affordability. Many of you in this room probably know people in your families or you yourself might be struggling with substance use disorder. Many of you struggle with the housing instability and fears and worries of finding decent and livable and affordable housing in the city. These are the many important issues that the next mayor needs to be ready to address. They're complex, they're not easy, it will take a lot of collaboration and hard work and understanding systems for how we're going to find these solutions, both immediate and long-term solutions. And that is time. So thank you so much. I look forward to getting into it. Thank you. I lived in downtown Burlington. I lived in Burlington for about 25 years. 
years. Uh, like many of you, I'm a renter, and I kind of felt like that was a perspective that hadn't been represented here uh, in the conversation we've had. There were a number of serious issues that were not being talked about, which is why I entered into the race. Uh, I kind of hoped that maybe someone else would do that, but it didn't happen that way, and that's kind of one of the reasons I came in at the last minute. Um, when I think back to the time when I got to Burlington back in the fall of 1999, I was living over on Buell Street at the time. And it was a particularly challenging time like it is now. Our vacancy rate was about 0.5%. Um, and that's kind of where it is today. And the one bedroom apartment that cost me $500 uh, is now going probably about four times that amount. But what has changed is the fact that our city has gone from being about 50% renters to being about 70% renters. And it's not gotten any cheaper. And I would say that the policies we've seen that have been enacted over the last 20 to 25 years are just simply not working uh, for a large number of people here in our community. And I think it's time that we have a conversation about that. Um, I look at the situation with the folks that are struggling, that are actually unhoused, that do not have a roof over their head. It really strikes me that a number of these folks are struggling with like an untreated medical condition, a mental health condition, or substance use disorder. And yet the best that the state can do is to put them up into the hotel program at great cost to the taxpayer at $3,800 per person per month and then not offer any kind of treatment whatsoever. And it seems to me that if we're trying to get people back into housing, we need to treat the underlying causes as to why they became houseless in the first place. So I think that what I would like to see and what I would do as mayor is I would try to engage with and work with our folks in the legislature to say, hey, we need to get a new state hospital. We need to provide beds for people. And you talk to folks that are struggling and you know that are involved on the front lines here, that seems to be the base issue. We just simply don't have enough beds. And we are relying, for whatever reason, on the private sector to create that. And I'm not sure that that's really the best solution. So um, I'd like to close on by just saying that I'm really grateful to be here. And to thank everyone who supported the campaign today. Um, one of the challenges of being an independent candidate is you don't have a political party infrastructure behind you. I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to bankroll my campaign. I don't have a huge staff, nor do I have you know, uh, an actual campaign manager. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, but we persevere and uh, try to do the best that we can. And I just want to thank everyone who's come out to provide support up until now. Thank you. Joan. Thank you, Justin, and thank you to the Student Government Association for having us here, and thanks for all the people who've taken the time to show up tonight. Um, I came to Burlington actually as a college student, but I didn't go to UVM. I was a college student at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania, and my sister was here going to UVM, which uh, made it a little bit easier to find a place to live here to come for the summer and work and the plan was to go back to Franklin and Marshall. Um, and my sister set me up, I think the first night I spent here on a couch on the corner of, uh, of Willard and College Street and then I was in an attic on Hungerford Terrace for the summer, which is a bad time to be in an attic, maybe there isn't a good time. Um, and then I was in a boarding house on North Willard Street, and then moved to North Street. So um, I have been around Burlington for a while, and uh, at, way back then, the housing in Burlington cost me three times what my apartment cost in Pennsylvania. And I've looked, and that has held for all these years. It's still about three times the cost here than it is in Pennsylvania. Um, which is a, a baseline issue that's driving a lot of our other problems. Um, so, uh, more recently, I have spent the last 20 years as a city councilor in Burlington, uh, a position I wasn't really planning on, on doing. I was trying to recruit somebody to run for city council because I thought things could be, could be done better. And I ended up getting recruited in the process, which I didn't think would happen because I had a baby in my arms when I was recruited. But um, these women agreed to babysit for very lengthy city council meetings, and I was uh, out of excuses. So I became a city councilor, and honestly, I wasn't really planning on running for mayor, but I was 
persuaded by a lot of people that I have the skills that we need at this moment. And it's a critical moment for Burlington. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, clearly we have problems that maybe were festering for a long time, but have really come to a head at this point in time. And I'm very proud uh, that I have been endorsed this is by the city's municipal worker unions. There are four unions that represent the city's uh, municipal unions, and I have the endorsement of all four of those unions, which include the police union, the firefighters union, um, AFSCME, who represents uh, workers in parks and public works, and across all city departments, as well as the electrical workers union. Um, I agree with a lot of what Chris just said about getting at the root causes of our problem and really addressing uh, housing, public safety, and town gown issues that are kind of prominent at this moment. Thanks. Thank you, and Will. Hi, my name is Will, uh, and uh, I came to Burlington in fourth grade. Uh, you know, um, my family uh, moved up to Burlington, and uh, it was me and my two sisters and brother and all uh, my mother. My parents got divorced uh, after we moved up from New Jersey. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we grew up in Burlington. It was a good place to grow up. Uh, you know, it was always a tough town, uh, but, uh, you know, people, people found a way to get along. And, uh, I think shootings were at a minimum back then, and uh, I really want to, uh, I'm, I'm running to turn Burlington around. I think we have a lot of potential here. I think working as a community, I believe, you know, uh, within UVM, within Champlain College, within uh, within Vermont Tech and CCB and, and, you know, other colleges that exist around the area, I think that there's uh, students that are there that can be a, a participant in engineering, architecture, CAD design, uh, you know, street design, things of that nature. I think that uh, infrastructure uh, needs improvement in this city. I believe that uh, uh, education especially needs improvement, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, I believe public safety uh, is, is, a, is a way to, uh, to bring patronism and business and tax base back to the city. Uh, my son was born at UVM Medical Center, uh, you know, so it's a hop, skip, and a jump that way, I would say. And, uh, you know, um, also the UVM Cancer Children's Ward knows me pretty well, um, not because of my son, but because I was there advocating for a patient. Uh, I also did some advocacy work down at Mass General Harvard Healthcare Center. Uh, off the books, I mean, this was me just be standing by a patient. And, uh, you know, I, I used my uh, union representation days uh, uh, to take my experiences to make sure no doors got slammed in that person's face. And I think, uh, you know, it's important to have empathy. And, and uh, you know, uh, that's kind of where I wanted to talk about the students. Uh, you know, UVM students could do a lot, I uh, think, to come together as a community and support uh, the students in our high school that are struggling. I mean, the dropout rate is five times the national average. And we re re recently heard, I recently heard along the path that there's uh, some children, ever-growing group of children that are becoming or at risk of becoming suicidal. And just consider the fact that there's partitions in between each class. If there's a student being bullied in that high school um, and the kid's in the next class over and he's finding a hard, hard time finding a place to get away, um, that could be causing a major problem with depression and mental anxiety. Um, and uh, I just, just wanted to let you guys know that these children have to walk, I'm talking 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds have to walk through a war zone to get to school in the morning. And, uh, you know, I think maybe we, if, uh, if the UVM uh, and Champlain College and CCB students uh, really wanted to band together and do something to support those students, now would be a good time to start planning that. I think that Burlington is at a point uh, where we need that uh, um, community collectivism in order to make sure that we all build out of this, uh, this situation that we're in. And, uh, you know, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, candidates, for that. Now we'll start with the first question. And each candidate, again, will have two minutes of uninterrupted time. And we'll start with Emma. The first question is, how do you plan to foster a sense of community and engagement amongst residents, particularly integrating students into this community? Thank you. Well, as I said in my opening, I was a community organizer for most of my career and also a labor organizer. And one of those skills that I learned over that almost 15-year career 
is truly about the need for community engagement and how to most importantly impact, uh, engage impacted people. And so I think students, and I know students, are part of our, this community. You add to the vibrancy, and yet sometimes there can be this, um, this feeling of a separation between the campus and, and the communities and neighborhoods. I think it's very important. We have so much in common. I know I mentioned before around the challenges of affordability, the challenges of trying to make sure that you all can also find jobs that pay livable wages and want to be able to locate here in Burlington. Those are the same struggles that working families are experiencing here in town. I include myself in that as a mom of two small kids who struggles to make sure we can cover the child care costs as much as we can cover the property tax bills that come each year. So for community engagement, we have these great neighborhood planning assemblies, but frankly, they're almost as old as I am, or they're a little bit younger maybe. But 40 years of MPAs really need an update to make sure that they are reflective of how we engage today and the modern struggles of um, what working folks, including students who work um, who either are on in class and or working jobs to make ends meet. And so I think we need to go beyond that. We need to make sure that they are vibrant and, and engaging spaces but we also need to make sure there's multiple places where folks can engage where you are. So that is better communication from the city. It's making sure our processes, especially on big projects that will impact you and impact neighbors, um, are easy, easy to understand and easy to provide input to your elected leaders. And I really think that things like participatory budgeting is a great idea It's done in New York City where folks are able to engage and weigh in and prioritize how we spend local tax dollars. That is a great way to learn about your city government, know how we're spending money and why we're prioritizing things like the Memorial um, Auditorium over the Moran Plan over other needs in our city. Thank you. So I currently live downtown near Church and College, and uh, before I lived downtown, I lived on Buell Street for 13 years. So I got to see a fair amount of college students come through in my time that I was there, and uh, one of the things that struck me was uh, just how much we had in common. And when I was there in the early 2000s, we actually got a neighborhood association together in, common, uh, in conjunction, collaboration with uh, the churches at the end of the street, the First Congregational Church and the First United Methodist Church. And we just basically went around and got to know our neighbors. And we ended up working together to put together a community garden. And that seemed to work really well to break down barriers and bring people together over a shared space. Uh, one of the landlords uh, that uh, had property there on Buell Street was kind enough to donate the space for the garden. So, um, you know, that was, I think, a successful model there. And I think that that's one thing we, we could do here. And it really comes down to finding commonalities and what, you know, shared interests, I think, treating people how you want to be treated. Uh, and just you know, engaging with them and asking them questions and trying to learn a little bit more about your neighbors. So um, I found that that's right actually worked before and I'm hoping it will work again. involved in my campaign as student interns and it's been really interesting how we have connected both through our campaign reaching out to students as well as students reaching out to us. Uh, I have a daughter who's now college age and although she doesn't go to UVM, many of her Burlington High School peers come here which has given me a really nice connection to many of the students on campus which I'm grateful for. Um, I'd like to continue those kind of internships in the mayor's office and pro provide those opportunities for students to engage in the real life uh, workings of the city. I also supported um, uh, a resolution quite a while back that, uh, that brought students, created student positions on our boards and commissions. Now those are generally for our um, high school students to participate in that. Um, the theme of my campaign is all hands on deck, and that really is about the fact that um, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas, and I certainly don't have the solutions to all of our problems. I really want to engage with my, my community and look to the experts in our community, invite them in to advise, to advise us and help us through what's really a difficult time here. 
one of the initiatives um, we're going to be taking on as soon as the weather gets a little bit warmer is to really engage as many people as we can in graffiti cleanup around the city. Um, and that's going to, it's not something, people are frustrated by that. It's not something that uh, can be tackled just by city employees alone. And so we're going to work together to, on kind of an adopt-a-block type program to try and take care of our city and bring back the pride that, that we have in our city. Thanks. Well, uh, I was going to save this for the new business section, but since Joan just mentioned graffiti, I just wanted everybody to see this. And my name is Will. I did, I, you know, I designed some flyers and a website. It's uh, Will for BTV. That's W I L L F O R B T V dot com. Uh, this is a business uh, that most likely was ran out of town, um, and um, I think that uh, you know, uh, and community collectivism is really uh, you know about people working together. And you know, I think uh, the college is a great place to find uh, students. Again, I said, I said this in my opening statement for engineering, for uh, for, for for business design, zoning. Uh, things of that nature, um, you know, uh, where would you go if you weren't a genius? Well, you would probably go to the college first, to look for some grad students, look for some entry level students, look for some uh, Champlain College, some UVM, uh, you know, um, some, some CCV, uh, some Vermont Tech if you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing and design of contracting, things like that, uh, construction, um, you know, um, I think uh, uh, plumbing, pipe fitting, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, building this city is uh, something that we're, we're kind of at a point where, where we need to rebuild a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I uh, would be there to encourage uh, good financial practices as opposed to poor, fi poor financial practices. Um, you know, um, one thing that I did as a longtime union representative, and it's funny, I just ran into um, Kelly Boulet yesterday as I was walking the streets. And uh, Kelly's, a, Kelly's a, one of Peter Welch's uh, uh, right-hand representatives, and uh, she used to work for Bernie's office. And I was up there numerous times um, representing my constituents uh, in the past because uh, we, you know, we had an abusive manager that we had to keep going back to Bernie's office until we finally got him removed. Um, and uh, also, I was up there for a veterans' rights issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, having a person in office that's going to inspire people and go door to door, as I have been doing, uh, finding out what the parents' concerns are. For instance, in the South End, a lady told me before every Little League game, they have to run around Callahan Park and pick up needles. Where are the needle receptacle cans? So I think, uh, you know, if you take a look at um, something that should have been done, instituted a long time ago, I think that it's time for the community to come together and, and act as one. Thank you. All right, thanks. Question number two, and this time we'll start with Chris. How will you ensure that the University of Vermont is held accountable with respect to decisions that have significant impact on the Burlington community? Well, I, I think yeah. I think uh, you know you enter into a good faith negotiation, and the first thing you do is you don't start by taking the first offer that comes along and say, "Well, that's the best we can do." I think it requires a give and take, but I think from a process perspective, we need to engage more with the neighborhoods. And as I understand it, the current MOU, the way that the process has unfolded, there wasn't a lot of collaboration, and if it were me, I think I'd go to the neighborhoods that were most effective, go to the neighborhood planning assemblies and other community groups and ask them, what are the things that you know are not working for you? What are the things that are working? What are the things you'd like to see change? What are the items that you think are important to include in an MOU? and try to draft it up that way and continue the back and forth negotiation. But right now what I see is a conversation going on between City Hall and the university and the folks that live in the neighborhoods most impacted seem to kind of be something of an afterthought. So I think more participation from the people who actually live here and that are affected would be one way to hold that accountability. Burlington doesn't have a lot of leverage over the university, but one of the things that we have is our zoning ordinance, and when the university wants changes to our zoning ordinance, it provides an opportunity to leverage some of the things that the city needs from the university. Um, the MOU that we had with the university expired in 2019, and between 2019 and today, the university expanded, expanded their enrollment and added 
um, 1,000 students to our, our residential neighborhoods, which is really problematic both for the residents and the students. There isn't any place for students to go. And I know that students are being forced to sign leases a year and more in advance. That is not fair, and it's not, um, international students are even more impacted by this. How are students supposed to find housing in this kind of environment? I have been a leader in pushing back um, on, uh, on UVM and their desire to, uh, to get an MOU and not really give us any surety into the future that there are that they're going to take care of their students and make sure that the students do have housing and build housing that is uh, you know well into the future that is uh, more than what they're adding to enrollment right now the MOU that we've been discussing is only a five-year MOU well as soon as the MOU is over uh, and you've built the housing that's about the point you've built the housing and now uh, now you can increase enrollment. I don't think that that's fair either to the students or the community in Burlington, and I think we really need a good partnership because we are dependent on one another. We're all one community here in Burlington. Well, pardon me, I didn't realize my mic was on before I was saying a knee-jerk reaction is I always want to clap for somebody when they talk. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, it's important that uh, you know we kind of try to make sure that everybody uh, acts acts in the best interest of the city of Burlington. And if somebody doesn't, then uh, you know, and if it's a university, then they'll be up there talking to the administrators and making sure that there's accountability there. Uh, you know, m um, much of my profession in life has been uh, about um, making sure that there's accountability. So uh, I think I think that uh, going forward having those conversations and making sure that you're up in those offices, having those meetings and making sure that people are all on the same page and what, what the common goal is for the city of Burlington. I mean, we win as a team, we lose as a team. Simple as that. I didn't learn that in college. I learned that coaching Little League Baseball. And, uh, you know, so college students and, and administrators, uh, I think everybody uh, in this city wants Burlington to be successful. I can't imagine that anybody doesn't. I think people are generally inherently good. And uh, so, so it's important for us to all work together as a community for that common goal of success of the city. Thank you. Thank you. So the well-being of UVM and the well-being of the city are intertwined. These are two important uh, parts of a relationship. And so one of the most important, important ways you have accountability is when a relationship is healthy and working and ongoing. And that is one of the things I've not seen um, done well between the city and UVM. UVM's leadership over the years has run a little bit hot and cold with the city, and the city needs to also prioritize staying on top of the MOU and other ways we engage the university. Um, so when we think about also what goes into MOU, it's important for transparency. As a state policymaker, I will say when we put legislation in place and pass the laws, it's very important that we also have ongoing uh, tra uh, transparency on how things are going. So in this case, how is student enrollment going? How is labor relations going? How is the UVM's commitment as an employer going uh, with the folks who work up here? UVM is, is a very large employer and is a very important partner of making sure we're setting standards for the families we want to be able to locate and the students we want to be able to um, stay and locate here in Burlington. I think the MOU is a big opportunity to put a lot of things on the table, including things like reestablishing the child care center that UVM closed and created more pressure on working families who work here and elsewhere in the community. It's another place, as other candidates have talked about, about doing, putting, our, um, uh, putting on the table what we're going to do about housing, making sure it's affordable for students, that they're not forced into triples or that should be doubles here on campus, as well as the impact on the community um, around the, the campus. It's also about respecting unions on campus and the right to organize. These are the kinds of employers we deserve in Burlington, and these are the kinds of ongoing relationships I will have with the president and administration up here as the next mayor of Burlington. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to apologize for not giving you all a second round on the first question. I will do that this time. Each of you has a minute to respond or extend and maybe talk a bit more specifically about um, how you'll ensure you can 
hold the University of Calumet, uh, Chris. You can also pass if you have nothing else to add. I have nothing else to add at this time, but I might have something to add after hearing what the other candidates have to say. <laughs> <laughs> you were first this time. Well, you're going to go through the order, though. So. Uh, well, I can just simply say, you know, a couple of, another uh, approach that's been advocated for some folks is, you know, the, the suggestion to cap enrollment here at university. Uh, I think it's a conversation worth having, but it, I think, again, if we can go back to root causes, why is the university bringing in so many students? It's like, well, you know, maybe they're not getting the funding they need, and I think the last time I checked, Vermont was, I think, number 49 in the country in terms of how much it supports uh, higher education. So, again, that's a function of the legislature, uh, the same legislature that granted UVM its charter. All right. Thank you. And Joe? I'll just point out that um, building housing on campus for freshmen and sophomores is the only kind of housing I can think of that can actually make the housing situation in the neighborhoods worse. Because if you're building more housing for freshmen and sophomores only to set them loose to find their own housing in the community junior and senior year, you have not helped the students and you have not helped the neighborhoods. Um, and that's why I have pushed hard on this MOU to, I, I don't want to take a hard line approach um, to prescribe a solution, but the bottom line is you have to demonstrate that you're improving our housing problem, not adding to it in the MOU. Thank you. Thank you. Will. Yes, and aside from what I just said about uh, UVM and accountability, I just want to add, you know, any, any time that you're adding housing, and I mean, if you look around the city of Burlington, UVM or not UVM, I mean, housing in Burlington has skyrocketed over the last 10 years. Um, I, I, if you, uh, I was just driving around today and just looking at all the new buildings that have went up and they're, they're high density residential. So if you put in new buildings, then you have to have infrastructure to, uh, to keep up with that. And that infrastructure actually, actually has to be in place ahead of time. So, so in other words, you don't hire an employee without a job. You don't build a building without the water, uh, uh, the, the, the disposal uh, you know, uh, ability to keep the integrity of your, of your downtown and all your neighborhoods intact. You know, and I think you see that when you have sewage overflows, and it's like, you know, people think that that's just a random occurrence. No, I mean, it's not all the time. Sometimes maybe uh, it might be a, a, a surge in rain or something like that, but uh, other times it's, a, you know, I, I remember uh, my buddy lived up uh, on Handy Court there uh, um, at the top of uh, UVM, right over this way, and uh, he... Uh, he, uh, you know, we walked down and we, every rainstorm we would be able to smell the sewage. Um, so that's something, you know, that infrastructure needs to be repaired. Thank you. Thank you. And Anna. Thank you. So a little bit more on the MOUs. I think it's really important to look at big agreements like this with a community benefit analysis and an understanding of what we need in our, in our city. And so one of the most important things is to think about what kind of guardrails do we need when we think about student enrollment. And so what UVM I've witnessed from living here for 20 years is a continued growth of student enrollment, which has a, an impact not only on housing, but the size of classes, the impact on staff, the impact on faculty. There's, there's much more than just housing one has to understand when we think about the growth of the university. So we need to have responsible growth of enrollment um, and have that honest conversation as part of the MOU. It may need to involve a student cap. It, may, it also needs to really understand that, that right, we have a big impact right now in terms of the base number of students. So the draft MOU that I've seen talks about what happens if zoning changes going forward, not the current number and addressing the current number of students and the current impact it's having on our community and on the classes here, on the staff here. So it starts with relationships, they need to be ongoing, and we need to make sure there's clear expectations um, from day one so that we're working in partnership, uh, again, going back to uh, <laughs> at Healthy Burlington. I can't see you, so I apologize. <laughs> I can. This format is, is tricky, though, I will say, being the, the way over in Siberia here. So. <laughs> I feel that way. I'm all alone. Uh, well, it seems, like, <laughs> it seems like housing is clearly an issue that's being brought up. And I know, because I work around students, that housing is a really big stressor and concern for them. So let's 
focus a little bit more specifically on that one. How do your solutions to the current affordable housing crisis differ from the past set of policies which led us to the current housing crisis? And sorry, this time we'll start with Joe. Thank you. Um, recently, I think we're making some, some changes to our zoning that can make a real difference with housing and encourage um, housing built at a much larger scale than what we have seen in the past. Those include the South End Innovation District, which is uh, down part of town where I live, and we have a massive parking lot there. Um, what better place to build housing than to repurpose a massive parking lot? And in that area, we're going to allow housing that's up to eight stories tall um, and really create, uh, hopefully create really an ecosystem and a neighborhood there that will be mixed use and uh, accessible for workers. Um, we're also right in the process now of approving something called Neighborhood Code, which would allow more housing to be built in every neighborhood in Burlington, and often allow people to build housing they've been prevented from building in the past that most people think is pretty reasonable. Like if somebody has a large yard and wants to put a tiny house in their yard, We've prevented them from doing that because we've said, you can only have one primary building on your lot. And so you couldn't put a, a tiny house in your yard. Um, so we're making some changes now that will allow for reasonable development in neighborhoods. And I will say that, that neighbors have rightfully pointed out some issues with, um, with this project. But I think that we can address those issues. And I think we can still go forward with something that does bring more housing to every neighborhood, and even more intense housing to our transportation corridors. Um, uh, also, we have prevented home ownership in our, in our city, as Will had mentioned, it's 70% renters. And in order to stabilize housing costs, the best way to do that is through home That's ownership. Time. I'm out of time, so I'll tell you about that if I get another minute. Thanks. <laughs> me that said 70% renters. Oh, sorry, that was Chris. But, but point taken. Um, I, uh, I, I stay away from using words like crisis. Uh, I just uh, told you guys in my last answer that Burlington over the last 10 year period has put up numerous, um, what we might refer to as high rise. I mean, maybe if, if you spend a lot of time in New York City, as I also do, uh, you, you might think uh, differently about a high rise. So, so you know, but, but Decker Towers was our tallest building. Uh, and not to mention Decker Towers in that context, because obviously there's a controversy going on over there where, uh, you know, and, and I've referred to this in other debates with solicitorcrisis.com, but they were actually be overtaken uh, in that building right now and essentially held hostage. And, uh, you know, but um, I, I believe that uh, as a city, we always need to work forward, uh, and, you know, with, and there's going to be housing development, okay? Um, but also, if you look at the seven towns surrounding us that are booming, um, Williston, Colchester, Shelburne, uh, 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 Milton, uh, Winooski, uh, Essex Junction, and uh, I'm leaving one out right now, <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm so used to naming those towns. Um, they're they're booming, and um, if you're a UVM student, I mean, we want you to live in Burlington for sure. But also, there's housing in uh, there's housing in the Chittenden County area, and uh, you know, Burlington, I believe, uh, needs to start uh, gainful employment, uh, you know, encouragement and, uh, and and local business incentives to stop the businesses that are leaving it on almost a daily basis. I think that that's one of the major controversies. I am completely against. Um, rezoning all these commercial places that are leaving um, uh, into uh, residentials, not as a whole, but just, just uh, you know, Burlington was famous for having mom and pop shops. I mean, when, what city do you know that a McDonald's left town and a local farm to table took over and ran it successfully? Um, so, you know, um, I, I think that I think that um, in, a, in a thriving city where we're talking about small businesses and a former union representative, you know, union representatives, you can't even use that word without representing That's workers. Fine. And, uh, and I think that um, those local businesses I need support. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, one of the ways we do things differently is acknowledging that the status quo has contributed to our housing emergency. And I do use the word emergency because it is a crisis. We've been building towards this for years. 
And we have to acknowledge that the status quo included, uh, included having single-family single zoned uh, parcels throughout the city for decades. That made it really difficult uh, for anyone who didn't have the economic privilege and wealth to be able to move into those homes. And it made it really difficult for us to have enough rental housing for the kind of need that we have today. So we do things differently by adapting and making sure we have a commitment to affordability, showing up and making sure we're updating things like our inclusionary zoning ordinance. When we do our neighborhood code work, which I've talked about since the beginning of this campaign, the need not only to be truly committed to affordability with the new housing we're going to do as we densify throughout the city consistently throughout the city, but a commitment to climate, which means aligning our densi densifying uh, efforts along the corridors so we can people can access public transportation and truly get out of cars and live in the biggest city in Vermont and not have to rely on a car. Um, I also think that we really have to be committed to renters. That's another deep and important way we change and do things differently when we do have so many renters here in, in Burlington. And what that looks like is really understanding what rent stabilization means. That includes rights for workers and finally getting just cause eviction ordinance in place. That means working through with the legislature to finish that process and starting the ordinance process here locally. And also working with property owners who are landlords who are doing the right thing to keep rents stable by thinking about uh, initiatives or incentives within the property tax system to encourage the right thing, which is keeping rents stable, instead of charging them the same property taxes that a landlord who's, who's viewing housing as a commodity and charging rents and getting a massive profit out of it, we should be treating landlords differently in terms of who is truly committed to renters and stabilizing um, that part of our economy. Thank you. So our approach clearly isn't working here, uh, and I learned a long time ago, I've been renting for about 25 years, I'm 50 years old, I can't afford to buy a home in this city like many folks, uh, but I learned a long time ago that higher taxes equal higher rate of rents, and you know, there's a number of factors that contribute to the unaffordability, and one of them is the fact that the city council, whenever it needs more money, continues to raise taxes, and if you're a renter, those increases on the commercial properties just get passed right along. We don't have the benefit of income sensitivity like homeowners do. When I'm out there talking to people who live and work downtown, uh, friends of mine, they tell me, yeah, you know, I'm paying over 50% of my take home pay on rent. I have to live with roommates to be able to afford to live here in, in, in town. Uh, yeah, my partner and I split up, yet yeah, we're still together because neither one of us can afford to bring our, our own, get our own place. Um, so, you know, that's one thing there. Uh, two, we've also seen, uh, you know, with the policies that have been in place, again, we have a 0.5% uh, vacancy rate now, the same as it was 25 years ago. So what that tells me is what we've been doing clearly isn't working. Um, and what we've seen in recent years is whenever single-family homes come on the market, they're purchased by uh, investors and at usually a great cost. And that's creating an issue for folks that actually want to stay here. I've heard from folks that are in their 20s and 30s say, I'd love to stay in Burlington. I just simply can't afford it. And last but not least, since I'm coming up on time, I'll simply say that we need to, when it comes to the houselessness part of housing, we need to completely re-engineer our approach. We, right now, people have to be out on the streets to get any kind of help. And we need to actually uh, reorient and go from trying to fix houselessness and trying to focus on trying to prevent it. And one way that we can do that <clears throat> is to look at potentially a universal basic income where we're taking the money that you know, had been, say, allocated to the hotel program and splitting that up, say, among eight different individuals or eight different households, give them an extra $475 a month that they could put towards their rent uh, or their food or you know, ha uh, you know, a fund for buying their own home. Um, so you know, that's another way uh, that we could, we could uh, address the issue. In this next round, I'd love to hear a little bit about how your proposed solutions are going to resolve some of these housing issues. I'll just say, as a faculty member with a partner who's a faculty member, we can't afford to live in Burlington, and it's a, it's a thing. So let's hear about the different ideas, starting with Joe. But are we getting rebuttals? Yeah, one minute rebuttals. Um. Yeah, I want to speak to some of the ideas that, that were put out there. First, um, on the property taxes, I actually uh, did pursue that because I don't think, I think you should get a break on the property taxes if you're charging less for rent. I own the duplex next door to me. I charge 
a little less than $2,000 for one unit, a little more for another unit. Um, and I pay, but for, and these are three bedroom units. So way under market value, but I pay the same taxes as somebody who's charging $3,000 or $3,500 a unit um, for that property. The problem is with the legislature. It's not something that can be done with, by the city of Burlington because the legislature requires us to tax them at market value. And I also want to say that the big driver of rents is not our taxes. As somebody who is keeping my rents down, I will say that. Um, the taxes can be passed on to the tenant, but the biggest driver of increasing rents is the market, the fact that there's such a housing shortage. So we need to build more housing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, where Burlington has failed uh, is uh, its quality of life. I think I think it's it's clear if you look around, um, you know, and, I, and I'm not I'm not one for if you look on my website, you'll see solicitorcrisis.com. I'm not one for that. I think the major crisis in this in this city is uh, is the threat of kids stepping on a needle, and uh, you know. But as far as housing goes. Um, you know, I, I want people to be housed. I mean, I, I sold my house on Blodgett Street because I couldn't afford the taxes in this town. Before I sold my house, I had about five homeless people living with me. Actually, uh, I went down and did a, an interview with a homeless person last night and asked them, uh, you know, A, has anybody came down and talked to you? And B, anything you want to talk about? I put that interview up on my website. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, I think that as a city, our main concerns need to be students, education, 27% dropout rate, five times the national average, that needs to be attended to. We spend more than $10,000 per pupil, approximately 10000 more per pupil than the national average, so something's not working here. We need to support our students, we need to support our teachers, public safety uh, is important, and, and infrastructure. I mean, those are, those are municipalities' responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Emma. Thank you. The next mayor, mayor needs to understand that they have an important job to do to work with our legislative delegation. So if there are things that we bump up across that knows we need a that we know we need a charter change, or we know that state law perhaps isn't written in a way that is responsive to the housing emergency that we need, that's when you work as a team and you put proposals together and you advance that. We need a creative leadership who understands how do you get to solutions that are immediate and needed. And we know that rent stabilization would not only benefit Burlington, it would benefit everywhere in this state. There's a housing emergency in the entire state. The other piece I would work on is making sure that we look at home ownership here in Burlington and model some similar income sensitized um, tax structure for folks on the local municipal tax. That will help folks on fixed incomes, working families be able to, to uh, weather the property taxes to make sure that we can still operate our city. And that is, again, another opportunity to partner because it will probably require a charter change to support, to work with our legislative delegation as a team to really get to the bottom of what can make our, our town more affordable. So I know there's just been some talk in recent years about having the no cause eviction, but as one of my younger friends said, well, what good is no cause eviction when you can't afford to live here? So I think, again, going back to a UBI approach where we can you know, provide people with assistance to make their own decisions on how they want to spend their money, uh, and I think that that would be one way to do it. But uh, before I go on, do we have any math majors out here? Well, that's unfortunate. You're about to get a math lesson. Uh, trigger one. So yeah, so here's, here's the dealio. Uh, affordable housing is typically defined as being no more than 30% of your take home pay. So if you're making about $15 an hour, which I think is common for a lot of folks, that comes out to about $30,000 a year, give or take. So that means the most you can spend out of pocket on rent is $10,000. If anybody here can find me a place that you can rent for an entire year for under 10 grand, you found something, you found the unicorn. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And we will have one more question before we go into audience questions. And Will, you'll get to start this one. Uh, what preventative measures will you implement to address the root cause of homelessness and to protect individuals at risk from becoming homeless? 
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, again, go on my website, uh, take a look at the homeless interview that I did last night. Uh, I, I, I know a lot of these people that are living on the street, uh, especially the ones that are from Burlington, and I can name those people on two hands. Um, you know, I was sarcastic in the first debate, said one hand, but, uh, you know, um, it was very, very interesting because the first question I asked him is, has you been a main topic of this uh, conversation during these debates? Has any other candidate came down and talked to you? No. Um, okay, so. Before I sold my house on Blodgett Street, I did have five homeless people living with me. I do care. I don't think it's a taxpayer responsibility to um, house the homeless and, and solicit people in from across the country because that is exactly what's happening. You'd be enlightened to see what that homeless person had to say about the issues. Um, and I strongly suggest that you go and watch that uh, because, uh, because I think that bringing gainful employment back to the city and businesses, uh, you know, the small mom and pop shots that we have run out of town with this createdcrisis.com that we we have here, and soliciting drug addicts to the city. Um, I am I'm, I'm the only candidate in this race that's against public injection sites. I think we need to stop soliciting people from across the country to be homeless here. Not all home, not all homeless people are uh, using drugs. That's clear, but also it is bringing in a lot of drug users. And um, I am, I am, I'm not going to be that guy that's going to call it a, a, a sickness. I've known a lot of people that have had drug problems growing up. And, and, and um, actually, one of the guys I talked to last night is a kid that I grew up with from elementary school in Burlington. And he said, I'm on the needle and I need to get clean. I need to go to rehab. I said, okay, well, anything I can do to help you. It's about empathy. It's about, it's about putting in your personal assistance on that. It's not about using the taxpayer dollars. I mean, we talk about throwing tax money at this. It's actually bankrupting our city. And, uh, and your city is not supposed to, your, your leadership is not supposed to engage in poor financial practices. That is a term largely used in the union as, uh, as, uh, as driving away business. A gainful employment, proper financial practice. And when I say poor financial practice, I mean a practice designed to drive away business. And the, the, the taxpayers are leaving our city. The businesses are complaining to me. I mean, one of the one of the local bars said they got slashings like every week. So the crime is up, and they can't even call the cops in some of these situations. Like we really need to focus on on on, on success as a city, as as one community. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. So. Folks who are unhoused in Burlington deserve dignity, they deserve respect, they deserve, deserve the acknowledgement that these are Vermonters. And we know, because the state interfaces with a lot of these folks, that these are Vermonters coming from smaller towns. I grew up in Barry City, which is a town that has no grocery store, no public transportation downtown, and it would be a, a very difficult to survive on the streets of Barry if I were unhoused right now versus moving to Burlington to try to be able to survive here. It's a little tiny bit easier. And with recognizing that we have the reality of not enough affordable housing, not enough housing period, we have to be humane in our understanding of this emergency we have for folks who are unhoused. A year ago, I led a coalition of Democrats and progressives in the Vermont legislature to sound the alarm when we were going to abruptly end the GA emergency housing program. This was the motel program. While imperfect, there was a period of time in the state of Vermont where we housed the bulk of unhoused people in our state. That was a dignified way to treat people, the people who live here in the state. They are, again, the majority of folks are Vermonters. Uh, we were able to get most of those folks rehoused, the folks who were most vulnerable by July 1st last year, but hundreds of people were still pushed out into the streets, and that is what we're living with here today in Burlington. We need a diversity of options on the table because not all unhoused folks are a monolith of people. There are folks with families, there are folks living with disabilities, there are folks who are elderly. There are many folks who are working full-time jobs and simply cannot find a place to live. So that is the reality that we're living with and it is unethical in my mind and, and I, my moral compass would not allow me not to find solutions as a community member and as the next mayor of Burlington. So, Bottom line, we need to work with partners that includes local communities around, in and around Burlington and the state to come up with solutions to bridge people for the next couple years to when we have actual housing built. We're on the way, I'll tell you as a legislator, we've built, we're building a lot of housing in historic investments, but it doesn't happen overnight. So we have to have a humane bridge to get people from today to tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Uh, so we'll say it again, our approach clearly isn't working and we need to fundamentally re-engineer how we approach the issue of housing here in our community and I think even in our state. And, you know, to my friend's point, you, people who are struggling here, there's little to no uh, assistance available. You have to be out on the streets to get any assistance. And if you're out on the streets, you know, it's much more costly to put someone back into housing after they lost it 
never mind the fact that it generally leads to worse outcomes for the individual who is unhoused. So again, we need to re-engineer, go back, and start to focus on preventing houselessness rather than trying to fix it. Uh, and again, splitting you know some funding available to people to help them keep the housing that they have, uh, I think is one way to do that. The other thing I think we need to uh, distinguish here in the conversation is, is um, there are generally two kinds of houselessness. There's situational houselessness and chronic houselessness. And situational houselessness is typically someone loses their job, uh, their partner passes away unexpectedly, uh, they have to file for bankruptcy because of unpaid medical debt, uh, any number of reasons. But these folks generally are pretty healthy individuals and if put up in a hotel for a few months, they can generally get back on their feet. Um, you know, within 90 days, and after 90 days, well, the chances of someone getting back into housing kind of drop off quite precipitously, which leads me to the next group of people. Those are the folks that are chronically unhoused, and most of the folks, or at least a number of them anyways, are struggling with an untreated mental health condition or substance use disorder, and they're not getting treatment. So in addition to saying, well, you know, we need to give people housing that provides them with dignity and respect, we also need to provide them medical treatment when it's uh, appropriate. And for a number of these folks, that is the underlying condition that caused them to lose their housing to begin with. And so it seems to me that we ought to be focusing on treating that. And if we can do that, we'll make great strides. But again, this is a larger issue than outside of Burlington. It's a community issue. It's a statewide issue. And we really need the state legislators to step up and start doing something like to provide us more beds. And one way to do that would be to have a conversation about establishing a new 100 bed hospital. We would be focusing on individuals that are struggling with mental health conditions or substance use disorder. It just uh, astounds me that you know we put people up and don't offer any kind Thank of you. treatment to solve the underlying issue. Thank you. It's the job of the state to provide a social safety net for all of our residents. And that's completely failed us. The hotel program was not a sustainable pro program. It's far too ex expensive to sustain, and that's why there's these ongoing arguments about whether to shut it down or continue it. We needed beds for people. You can't just put them out on the street. But at the same time, you have to do it in a way that is affordable. We need more shelter for people. And as far as the, the root causes of homelessness, I agree that it's not a monolith. There's a lot of different causes for how people end up um, without, without housing. And uh, you know, the baseline is the cost of housing. We need more housing that's affordable. There's also, as Chris just said, substance use disorder, mental health, and we had a major encampment right next to my neighborhood um, at Sears Lane. And I would go in and talk to the folks who were there to understand better how they ended up there and what they needed to get out. And it was surprising how many people had come out of incarceration without IDs. How do you get housing? How do you get a job when you're coming out of incarceration without IDs? So I. Follow, I've been following this to try and figure out, like, why do we have this problem? And the correction says, we give them ideas. And I finally have recently come to understand that the disconnect here is that the ID that they get is a Department of Corrections ID. <laughs> That's not really helpful. We have, we have a non-driver's ID that we could be providing people. We know who they are, that we have their fingerprints. So there's a lot of different reasons. I think we can do a whole lot better for people coming out of incarceration to help them be successful, um, help them find jobs, find housing. People coming out of treatment need more support to be successful, and we need the state's help. All right, okay. now each of you will get one minute. We'll okay. go ahead. So, and, and it's it's surprising to me that nobody's talking about the other homeless encampments that are popping up, okay? This is the Manhattan Drive in Camden. I don't know if anybody's been down there recently. I know at least one person in here uh, used to coach uh, sports or, or participate in Little League and, and has kids in this town. Are you walking through these parks with your children? Are you letting them run through there barefoot like we used to at Oak Ledge Park? Because I'm not. And, uh, and um, you know, um, how many of these homeless people are housed in Burlington Hotels, that nice Hilton downtown? Ever see a homeless person there? Never. So, um, so why should Burlington be the ones to shoulder um, a bunch of influx that's actually driving away business? 
and uh, you know, and, and I'm all about humanity. Trust me. But if it's if it's if it's ruining your city, and it's not the homeless people, because you, if you watch the interview that I did last night, you'll see this gentleman made a lot of great points, and um, you know, I think he has a bright future. Um, and uh, he talked about the crises that he's been uh, that he's had to endure, and, and I totally understand it. But but you know, um, also you have to you have to move as one in in, in, in support of the success of the city, and uh, understand what taxes are supposed to support. And especially the students, guys. The students. Thank you. One of the, my many meet and greets I've had over the campaign, I was meeting with some folks in three, uh, Cathedral Square, and one of the folks uh, was formerly unhoused. And he said, when you are unhoused, you want to be invisible. You want to be invisible. And it, is, it, it really struck me because it is one of the hardest times in your life um, when you're simply trying to survive and get yourself in, uh, back up on your feet. And we have to recognize that there are structural things we can do to help people uh, maintain that economic security that would keep them from becoming unhoused. And that includes things like protecting renters with just cause eviction rights. It includes making sure that we are protecting and supporting unions to organize in our town so folks have a chance, a legal chance to organize and negotiate livable wages and decent health insurance. A lot of folks also find themselves um, losing jobs and going in, again into um, uh, homelessness because of health care um, and lack there of health care or an illness or, or the medical bills and medical debt that people uh, uh, accrue when they have a, a chronic illness. So we have to think about this again with a commitment to understanding the human beings involved. Thank you. Chris. Uh, yeah. Um, I had a thought it kind of escaped me here. Um, with respect to the folks that are out of house right now, I think, you know, you look around the room and here we are, we all have our housing, we're talking about the unhoused. So maybe one of the first things we can do is bring the unhoused to the table to ask them what their really needs are. And uh, like Will, I have made a point to get out and talk to some of these folks in the downtown. And it's pretty interesting about the experience they have to go through, how they have to fill out multiple applications and how they're treated in a very degrading and dehumanizing way. I have to go to what some people have heard as a government bean counter to determine if they're eligible for the services. Um, you know, it's just, we all get to go home at the night. If we have a rough day, we can sit down and have a beer. Well, that's not really an option for a lot of these folks because they can go to the dry shelter where nothing happens, uh, or they can go to one of the low barriers where everything happens. There's no really in between. So once again, that's that binary choice that we have there. Um, one thing that came out of a conversation, I don't know where I'm with time, but uh, folks you know, get uh, struggle with, with money. So uh, having an everyday worker program where we could put folks to work with help with that as well. Thanks. Um, getting getting back to the root causes of homelessness, and which is quite different than what do we do once people are homeless. I really think we need to focus on getting people the mental health care that they need when they need it, rather than when they they have escalated or spiraled so much that they need much more intensive treatment than if we had just addressed the problem in the beginning. The same thing goes with treatment beds. We don't have enough treatment beds, and when we finally get a treatment bed, we're not offering <coughs> quality or quantity of treatment for people to be successful, nor are we offering them the supports that they need when they get out. We need more sober houses. We need more supportive housing. Um, and I have gone and talked to people who are living in encampments, people who are using the resources at COTS, and um, there are a lot of different reasons, but we're really, we are really failing people in how we provide treatment and support hospital. All right, let's just give one more round of applause to all the candidates for these questions. Now I'm going to ask the audience for questions, and folks with mics will be going on around the room. I see hands up. Uh, just really quick, one thing I want to say is, well, two things I want to say. One, we're not going to do second rounds during these, so we can get to a few more questions. And second, I think we've covered housing and homelessness issues pretty well, so only if you, I will say, I'm sorry, but that question has been covered. If you're asking a question 
that has already been covered too much that we can get out of their ideas. Okay. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my question it is two part. But before I start my question, uh, I want you to know that I love Vermont. I live here since 1996, I believe. And Vermont, for me, I am like fish. If I leave the water, I will die. <laughs> but the question, what you can do with new immigrant? Because the immigrant, when they come, I used to tell my kids, if they get sick, don't go to UVM, don't call doctor, call taxi. Because when you call taxi, you will find the driver, he is a doctor. You will find one like me, mechanical engineering, in my back home, and when I come, no one look to me and I have to drive taxi. What you can do with the, with the new immigrant? Are you gonna make them to feel this is my home, their home? The second question, we're talking about housing. But I didn't hear anyone talking about education. The education should be the first part. Because you need to build the house, you have to have engineering. And the engineering has to come from UVM. You need, you are sick, you have to have a doctor. And the doctor will come from UVM. No one talking about education. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for to all of you. Thank you for the question. Uh, and we'll start going back with uh, seat number one, Emma, and we'll just go down the line up to two minutes to answer these questions. Thank you. I heard two questions. I'm going to try to do both really quickly. Um, really important questions because immigrants and refugees are a critical part of our community. And so in terms of employment, really being conscious about pathways to employment, to making sure that we, again, work with the state. Local government needs to work with state government. That's just the way it is. So making sure that folks, when they come with certifications and degrees and licenses from elsewhere in the world, that we can have some respect for the folks', folks education and training and skills to make sure you can have that opportunity here in Vermont. Um, I also think that we need to work on making sure our communities are inclusive in a place where your people feel they really belong. That requires cultural competency training of folks who are, are city, uh, who work for the city, it includes cultural competency for our police, for our medical providers, um, and also within our schools. And our schools, as a mom of a, of a four-year-old and eight-year-old, our schools need a lot of support right now. It's been a very difficult time for the last several years, um, and especially in our middle school and high school for two similar reasons, but also the fact we don't have an actual high school, um, our young people are really struggling. And we have to make sure that we're thoughtful about programming to, um, after, after school hours, which is the riskiest time for young people. We have to consciously partner as a city to bring back a vibrant youth programming. Um, because when we had 242 Youth, uh, the youth Center, there was, some, there was at least a conscious partnership with the city, and we've lost that. So I think bringing that back together, it's an intervention and prevention moment to really support young people in the city. Um, and to also make sure we support all of the families, but especially immigrant and refugee families, uh, to make sure they, they have the support they need to navigate things that might be new, because the America, uh, you know, the states are different than places where folks are relocating from. We have a real struggle with a lot of guns in our communities, um, substances, things that their, their children are getting exposed to, and we have to show up in community with folks. Um, it benefits all of us when folks can feel they belong here and that this is a healthy community for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. So I'm glad that we've been able to uh, be home for a number of new Americans here. I feel that the folks that come here from uh, elsewhere really bring in a level of diversity and really help make us what we are as a city here. Um, as for the new American experience, I'll speak a little bit closer to home. My wife is Hungarian. She's first generation American. And her father fled Hungary in 1956 during the Hungarian Revolution. And he was nine years old. His brother was seven. And they were fleeing their home with suitcases, what they could carry on their back. They you know, could hear gunshots, soldiers, dogs in the distance, and knowing if they had been stopped, their parents would likely have been killed, and Andrew probably would have never seen his brother Stephen again. So America has always been a beacon for those looking for something better. And I think that one thing we can do is to keep that door open and allow people who want to be here to come here and to be successful in America. And I think that education has been something that's important to me. I've served on the school board. My wife is a middle school teacher. I think education is the great equalizer. Um, 
and it's something that we really don't hear too much about, uh, you know, these days in the mayoral race. And for me, I understand, you know, it's typically been the purview of the school board, but we should be asking ourselves, what can we do as a city hall to better support the work uh, of the school department to provide kids with a quality education? And right now we have a crisis of literacy in this state. That's another big crisis that we're not nearly talking about. And we need to ha have a conversation about that. Um, so I think that um, I think that there's more that we can do here as a city, and it really begins with rolling out the welcome mat and making people feel welcome and provide them with opportunities to get an education and to move on. And I'm very grateful for the folks that have come here and done exactly that. They make our community vibrant and they make it stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for raising the question. And I have a lot of experience working with immigrants in a variety of diff different ways. My daughter was, um, when she was an infant, she was in a home daycare of a Cambodian family who came here as refugees. And I saw their struggles. They had four kids. I saw their struggles in the schools. And I saw their struggles really with American culture and understanding how to both blend with and try to preserve and understand American culture, which is hard. It doesn't have the same kind of boundaries from where she came from. I also, um, uh, more recently, I housed a group of Afghan refugees who came here on very short notice and struggled with them with things like how to get transportation, how to get a license. There's not a lot of support coming for refugees when they arrive here. And it's, so, it's reliant on, this, the system doesn't really work. It's reliant on individuals doing everything we can. And thankfully, we do have a welcoming community here in Burlington. And I think a lot of individuals trying to make up for where the system fails. Um, I also had a business, and I employed um, many uh, refugees from Bosnia, um, as well as from, from Asia. And I saw how their families stick together, and I have such great admiration for the sense of family that I saw in these immigrants. And I reached out to the King Street, um, the King Street Youth Center, where many immigrant families go, and held a meeting there of city leaders to hear directly from the immigrants, because quite honestly, we don't understand what all of your, your struggles are here. And they were quite different than what we were projecting, because we need to hear directly from immigrants. We need to reach out and have those conversations. So thanks for raising the issue. Thank you. Right, thank you. Well. Yes, sir. And, uh, and I also, uh, I totally agree with you uh, that we need to improve our education. I think uh, if you, if you uh, my opening statement um, was, Burlington has a 27% dropout rate. That is five times the national average. It's actually so bad that um, when Courtney from Seven Days interviewed me, she actually tried to deny it. I said, "Ma'am, it's 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 up on it's it's in the stats. Like it's in the national stats now. I think it needs to be focused on. I think that so the teachers need our support. I think that the students need our support. I think these students are walking through, stepping over needles on the way. A nine-year-old stepping over needles on the way to school. That's not something I grew up with in Burlington. I should say." I have seen that in low-income units growing up because I was a product of low-income housing. Um, you know, um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I interviewed uh, the leader of the Somali Bantu community the other day, and his thoughts on public safety and, 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 and the Somalians that have, uh, have, uh, have become a victim of the crime in this city uh, was very interesting, and you should watch that. Um, also, you know, the first first family that I, I met when I came over here was also Cambodian. Uh, uh, it was close family friends of ours, and. Um, you know, recently my uncle took in a group of few Ukrainian refugees. Um, you know, when those three Palestinians got shot, my cousin was the first responder that took that phone call. Um, you know, like, so, so I think that as a community, we all care about uh, new Americans. And I'm, I'm spending my time in the Nepalese community. I'm finding out that their, their population has dwindled from like 35, I think 3,500 to about 1,400. Um, and uh, today I was down at Shalomar Indian Cuisine uh, talking to that gentleman that owns that business. And, you know, so I think that uh, a, a lot of these communities, we, we, we we don't understand sometimes that everybody's really feeling the heat in Burlington. And, and again, I, I mentioned uh, gainful, gainful practices that benefit the community, not just businesses, but taxpayers that are leaving. And you know who's absorbing them? Um, you know, the next town over. 
And, um, and I think that uh, I think that what we need to do is start supporting all of our communities, new Americans, old Americans, um, Native Americans, and um, and um, you know currently it's Black History Month. Like I think it's time to start educating our youth and maybe taking some out of town trips for education and, and raising our graduation rate and coordinating with other cities, cities, sister cities, making new sister cities, whether poor or rich. Thank you. All right. Thanks, folks. I'm not in charge of picking. I think the those here will pick people to ask. I think we'll have time for maybe two more questions. Um, um, I'm a student that lives downtown, and I know nobody's asked about criminal justice yet, but I'm curious, with our current state's attorney, Ms. Sarah George, what your guys' thoughts are on her trends of non-prosecution. Uh, I'm a first-hand witness of multiple crimes that have happened myself and my roommates at our house. No further investigations were launched. No prosecution to those involved. I uh, just want to get your thoughts if you're displeased at all or worried, or if you're going to continue trends with that uh, when one of you takes the seat in the house. All right, thanks. We'll start with Chris with that question. So I, I live in downtown too, and I, I've had some similar experiences here. Um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with uh, State's Attorney George and Mr. Alana for philosophy, but what I will say is that she works incredibly hard to do what she has to do, and that, like many industries, they are facing uh, a resource issue. In this case, in addition to a lot of physicians retiring during the pandemic, we had a lot of judges retire. So when they have, you know, um, violent crime, uh, that's what they're going to prioritize. And a lot of the lower level things, like the simple assaults and some of the shoplifting tests kind of push it aside. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, my vehicle was burglarized a couple years back. I had $5,000 taken out of it in, in a similar manner. They did an investigation and it was closed within a couple weeks and the perpetrators were never identified. Uh, just a few months ago in, in October, my wife here was driving to work just before 7 a.m. Um, right outside here. Uh, and another vehicle was approaching, driving the wrong way down um, Main Street and, you know, caused an issue there. And then just a few weeks later, my stepson, who's a third-year student here at UVM and works at the library, was violently assaulted while responding to a, a noisy complaint uh, on the second floor and uh, ended up sustaining a concussion and missing uh, several days of work and an entire week of school. So uh, I get it. And I think that there are things that we can do as a mayor, you know, and one of those is to set the tone. And when the mayor's setting the tone of, well, you know, don't arrest people, just move them along, there's, you know, consequences for that. So I think at the end of the day, we need to look at folks that are struggling and understand the, the concerns as to why, and if their behavior is being motivated, again, by an untreated medical condition, then we need to look at getting them treatment. Um, and I think that that's more where, where we're falling down and where there's more of an opportunity. But to be clear, you know, um, we need to recognize that when someone has a medical condition, they have a legal right to refuse treatment. And a number of these folks have done that, and it's called, and it's what I think the clinicians refer to as being service resistant. So if someone decides to, oh, well, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Joan. I was on my, the edge of my seat waiting for the end of the sentence, but okay. Um, you all can finish your sentences when I call them. <laughs> I, I don't know, you did not know that question was coming, but by chance I did um, bring with me uh, a police report that we got yesterday um, where, some, where a woman, 28 years old, was picked up at De Decker Towers and there was a warrant out for her arrest. It tells us since December 2023 alone, she has had 45 law enforcement encounters and 13 arrests. Most of these recent law enforcement encounters are associated with complaints about vehicle theft. This is the kind of issue I think that you're referencing. And I, I don't think that we can blame this all on Sarah George. There's actually, it's more complex. Um, it has to do with the entire justice system. It has to do with judges. It has to do with Vermont law. Um, and we do need changes, but my approach as mayor is one, we need to work with partners, we need to work with Sarah George. Um, we need to work with the legislature to change the laws. And meanwhile, as I think Chris was saying, we do need to arrest people when they are openly using and dealing drugs in our public spaces. We do need to arrest people when they are stealing, stealing cars or breaking into homes. And in Burlington, we need to do our part of the job 
to, to bring about justice. There are real victims when these crimes happen. happen. We have to recognize that. The people committing crimes may be victims as well, but you cannot victimize the rest of the community. We need to keep people safe, and this kind of, this kind of action is not keeping people safe. So I am committed to working on that. Thank you. Cool. I always forget to turn off my mic. That, uh, that's a great question. I think you should, uh, you should, we as a community, as a state, on that one, um, should really get together and, and run somebody else for that office. Um, I, I think it's about time. Uh, you know, if you call 658-2704 right now, I won't patronize you guys while actually making the phone call, but I really want to. Um, what you're going to find is uh, in progress, theft, attempted theft, graffiti, threat, vandalism, threats, uh, to harassment, identity theft, lost property, uh, prop, uh, <laughs> suspicious activity, um, damage activity, illegal dumping. Uh, we talk about being a zero, net zero city. Uh, well, if you dump illegally some toxic waste in this city, you'll get it right away with it, guys. Don't worry about it. Um, hit and run, no problem. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I, uh, on my website, I'm the only candidate this race calling for 112 police officers. I think you've got to be careful with vague ambiguities. I'm putting a number on it. It's 2,500 citizens. We have put up a bunch of new buildings, high-density residential. Um, you know, um, we need a police force to encourage business. Uh, patronism, tourism, that's where our tax money comes from. Also, uh, uh, um, 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 taxpayers are leaving this city on a, on a regular basis right now. They're, they're being absorbed by Essex Junction, Williston, and all those other towns that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, in, a, in a gainful uh, practice would be to uh, support the police uh, because they are supporting our community. We want our children to walk to school in peace. Well, our 27% dropout rate is very reflective of the fact that we don't have safe streets. And, um, and um, I think it's time for us to, uh, to treat Burlington what it should be in the state of Vermont, which is actually a powerhouse. Burlington should be uh, academically achieving at the highest possible level. And that would bring our athletics up as well. I mean, you know, I believe in academics. I also believe in athletics because that's team building. That's where you teach your children to win as a team, lose as a team. No one of us is better than the other. No one of us is lesser than the other. It um, doesn't matter what country you're from. You know, uh, or, or, or what language you speak, or what, whether you're, uh, you're you're Muslim, Christian, uh, uh, Hebrew, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, one of the great interviews that I did was with this, the dude from the Somali Bantu community. He spoke about public safety, and he had some very interesting things to say. I think you guys should check that out. Thank you. And Emma. Thank you. We need a community safety system that's dynamic and comprehensive, and our current system is simply not working. When you call for help, you need help to come, and you need the right kind of help. We also need leaders amongst our community safety system that actually work together to solve solutions and not get entrenched in positions and blaming and, um, and, and pointing out who's more to blame in the situation. That gets us nowhere. And we also need to make sure that our state's attorney, Sarah George, our police leadership, as well as the other aspects of our community safety system, which is the Community Justice Center, for example, in the city, are all working comprehensively together, sharing information, filing, filing timely police reports, um, and, and working on getting through what we all know is a serious backlog that has been a backlog of cases uh, since the pandemic. We also have a shortage of judges, so it is a structural reality that we are not able to clear as many cases. So that, these things compound the problem that we're all living through. But we also have to be very strategic about the use of our resources and making sure we're focusing on the folks who are causing the most harm in our community. When you talk to law enforcement leaders, they know who are the folks in our community causing the most repeated harm. And I think one of the candidates mentioned this, for example. So that's how we strategically use our police. That's how we strategically use and partner with our state's attorney's office. Everybody wants a safer community, so let's work in that direction to make sure we are um, handling the folks causing the most harm. And then not creating more harm by locking folks up who are struggling with substance use disorder. Jail is not treatment. It creates more harm, and that is the last thing Burlington needs um, when we are trying to get to the bottom of community safety. All right. Thank you all. If you all don't mind, one more question. Do you mind sticking around for a bit? Folks, good? One more question? Yeah, there was one. Yeah. Is that all right? Uh, I can probably, I can need it, it's a spar. Um, I would like to speak on the recent... for the video, you might. Oh. Some people online can't hear if you don't... Perfect, sorry, gotcha. I, I would like to speak specifically on the apartheid free city resolution that was shot down recently. Um, I'm not looking for your personal opinions on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't feel like that is 
extremely relevant to Burlington as a city on the mayoral race, but I do have to wonder, what are your thoughts on a citizen-led referendum being shot down by the city council? What are your thoughts on the fact that it was not even allowed to go to the ballot, that it was not even allowed to be voted on in the first place? All right, thanks. And the quicker you can comment, the better. That would be great. But you have two minutes. Uh, let's start with Joe. Thank you. Um, this was a question that was proposed, and my initial reaction to it is that I would put it on the ballot because people got the signatures that are required to put it on the ballot. Um, but as I got more input from the public, it became clear to me that there was a minority group that was being really negatively impacted by having it on the ballot. And I think you have to be cognizant uh, that, that you can put a question on the ballot that causes harm to the community. And there is a requirement that we consider the common good when we put a question on the ballot. There's a reason why it does have to pass through the city council. There was a similar case, or we can argue a similar, dissimilar, but the rebel name was uh, uh, considered to be racist, and they decided in South Burlington to not use the rebel as their mascot anymore. And the, there were people that got the signatures and they wanted to put the question on the ballot. It was deemed to be harmful to the community, and so they chose not to put that question on the ballot. And I think that that's a reasonable consideration for whether or not we put, put something on the ballot. It may be that the majority agrees with the question, but we have to think about how that impacts our local community. And this is, I know that people wanted to weigh in on an international issue. There was many ways to do that. There's many ways for us to use our voice. And I have to be um, respectful when people share with me how it harms them. Thank you. Will. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think, and, and also to the gentleman who I don't see sitting there right now uh, that asked a question about what are you going to do about change uh, with the criminal justice system. It's uh, vote, use your vote right now, it's the election. So if you don't like the way the city council operated in that situation, I would suggest that you pick somebody on this stage that wasn't part of that. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, you vote for me. My name is Will. <laughs> I think Williams are where they put it on the ballot, though. All right. Thank you, Will. Emma. Thank you. Um, I support the direct democracy aspect of our city charter, and residents collected enough signatures. So the item, the question at the time for city council and mayor was whether or not to put that those parameters, those rules were met within the city charter, and they were. Um, what happened, though, was the conversation was had at the city council level, which caused even more harm. And there were multiple minorities, multiple marginalized, is a better word I use, marginalized communities impacted by this very critical question. And some were heard and some were not heard. Um, and so there are folks in the Palestinian community, there are folks in the Jewish community. It is critical to understand the impact that this has all the way around and making sure that we're not gatekeeping as um, folks whose only question was whether or not this would, they had met the charter change, or sorry, the charter rules are putting this on the ballot. And then the proper place for that conversation, hopefully in the most um, uh, safe and constructive and um, uh, real way, was then going to be allowed to be in the community if the question was able to be put on the ballot, but it wasn't. So that was a real disservice to all of you in this community who clearly care about global issues, clearly folks live here who are impacted directly by these global issues, and you were not allowed to have that larger conversation, and that was um, a real uh, harm to all of you as uh, here in Robinson. So that's not the first time that that's happened. So the city charter is quite clear about this, that advisory questions, which fall within the purview of the city council, the city council ultimately has final authority on whether or not those um, questions get onto the ballot. They kind of have a veto power there, if you will. Um, so in terms of process, if you're not happy with the way your person voted, as Will had said, you know, get out there and vote and make your voices heard. Um, I would just simply say that me personally, as a, as a candidate, I'm running for mayor of Burlington. I'm not interviewing for a job at the State Department. Um, if I wanted to get any questions of foreign policy, I'd run for Congress. I'm not. Um, when I go around, I talk to people here in town. I hear a lot of feedback. Of, like, we got real serious issues here in town. The city's become unaffordable. Housing is out of control. We've got major public safety issues. Why is the city council engaging in foreign policy discussions about halfway around the world? And the reality is, is 
it's nice to take the pulse of the community and we can weigh in on the issues, but what we say and do here in Burlington is going to have very little impact on what the forces in that part of the world are going to do. So, um, again, if you're unhappy with the process, I would say make your voice heard at the ballot box. All right. Uh, let's give one more big round of applause for everyone. And regardless of who you vote for, I agree with that last sentiment. Make your voices heard at the ballot box. Uh, thank you all for coming. This was a really great debate. I, there's so much information that's spinning through my head now, and I'm honestly glad I'm not a Burlington resident. <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad that you all showed up and that the candidates all showed up for you. Uh, Good job, Justin. Thank you.